The headquarter for the Gnostics, of course, was Alexandria, which is the primary library center of the world at the time. Now let me, we could spend a lot of time wading through scholastic arguments about the texts. I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you a shortcut. I'm going to show you a shortcut. Um, there are, in the Scripture, there are authentication codes. There's an automatic security monitor watching over every single letter of the text that doesn't rust or wear out and it's been running continually for several thousand years and most people don't know about it. There is a fingerprint, what I call a fingerprint signature of the author in the Scripture and uh, we'll show you that. And furthermore, this authentication code is of a non-compromisable design. Now if you're an engineer your mouth is watering. Boy, where is this thing? I want to see this thing. Let me back up a little bit now and give you some background. How many of you have noticed there are sevens in the Bible? Anybody without their hand up hasn't read their Bible, right? Yeah. Over 600 passages have it very explicitly so. Some of these are very overt. It's very obvious. Seven of this and seven of that or whatever. Some of them are structural. Someone will list a few things. You'll always notice there's always seven of them. You find those. They're subtle. Some are not only subtle. Some are actually hidden. And yet you can find them if you know how to look. The, I'm going to suggest to you the possibility that these heptatic structures are a signature of the Creator Himself. And let's take a look at some examples. I want you to imagine, you don't have to actually do this, but I want you to imagine yourself seriously taking this on an assignment. Imagine yourself taking on a scratch pad, blank piece of paper, and I want you to design a family tree, a genealogy. And by the way, for this assignment, you can do this from fiction. You can make it up as you go. How many could do that? Obviously you could. Okay, that's, that's, no, that's no problem. You know, fathers and sons, make up a family tree. Okay. Except I got a couple of rules I want you to follow. When, when you finished your assignment, you turn it in. I want the number of words that you used to be an exact multiple of seven. In other words, if I take the total number of words that in, is in your uh, uh, work product, if I divide it by seven, I don't have any remainder. So it's either seven words, 14, 21, 28. In other words, whatever number of words you use, it's an exact multiple of seven. How many could do that? You could fudge it around to a multiple of seven. Right? Good, yeah, sure you could. Of course you could. I've got another rule I want to add. I want the number of letters that you use to also be an exact multiple of seven. I can sense that some of you have dropped out. You say that, that you begin to realize that's a little tricky. And incidentally, I'm talking about in English here, aren't I? English, you can fudge around sometimes. You can, poets always do that. You, know, you throw an asterisk in or something. Okay. There's an, I want the number of vowels and the number of consonants to be divisible by seven exactly. If I go through all your words, I count the vowels, it's an exact multiple of seven. You got a problem with that? Of course you do. You realize that to make it a multiple of seven, if it's a random result, you've got six chances of losing and only one of winning, if, having come out right. You with me? So every time I add a rule, it makes it tougher. I'm going to say, I want the number of words that begin with a vowel to be divisible by seven. Well, that's kind of chicken. And obviously, if that's the number of words begin with a consonant, it must be divisible by seven. The number of words that occur more than once to be divisible by seven. Do you, anybody still playing? You get the feeling that this would be hard to do, right? Those that occur in more than one form divisible by seven. Those that occur in only one form to be divisible by seven. The number of nouns shall be divisible by seven. The number only seven words shall not be nouns. That's easy, probably, maybe not. The number of names shall be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns shall be permitted beside names. The number of male names shall be divisible by seven, and the number of generations shall be divisible by seven. You've probably guessed where I'm headed here. Because this is a description of the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first 18 verses of the book of Matthew. And, in, and incidentally, we're talking about the Greek, not the Hebrew or English. In English, it's soft. You can fudge around. Greek is incredibly precise. Every verb has to meet five conditions and so forth. It's a tight, precise language. And what I'm sharing with you here, of course, is the discoveries of Dr. Ivan Panin. He's a very interesting guy, born in Russia in 1855. He was exiled in early age, he got tangled up in a plot against the Tsar. He eventually emigrated to Germany and then finally to the United States. He graduated from Harvard in 1882 with a PhD in mathematics. 
But then he discovered Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, every one of us in this room that has discovered Jesus Christ, whether you know it or not, is a result of a miracle wrought by someone's prayer. For some of you, the stories are really quite dramatic. For many of us, it's quite routine. But every one of us that accept Christ are a result of a miracle. But if you're a PhD from Harvard, that's a miracle indeed. Okay, so. But shortly after becoming a Christian, he discovered this, these heptatic structures, these sevenfold structures that underlie the biblical text. He discovered that about 1890. He committed the rest of his life, more than 50 years, generating over 43,000 pages, writing incidentally in very small letters, he's got a very tight hand, uh, of discoveries. He went to his Lord on October 30th of 1942 and left behind all kinds of, of uh, discoveries. Candidly, it's very tedious to go through because it's laborious stuff, and yet what comes out of this are some treasures, and I'll show you a few highlights. That was the one that I showed you. The, the genealogy of Jesus Christ fits all those conditions. And even if you try to simulate that, you'll discover it's almost impossible to get something to fit all those conditions. But let's talk about a specific practical example. If you look at your Bible, at the last twelve verses of the Gospel of Mark, you will probably find a footnote in it. Something to the effect that these verses are in dispute and were probably added later by some copyist. That's the typical kind of remark you see, annotating the last twelve verses of the Gospel of Mark. And uh, the question is, uh, were they added later? Or, you know, Westcott and Hort um, regards the last part of Mark, that's verses uh, 9 through 20 of chapter 16, as a later addition, that this wasn't in the original, it was added by well, some well-intended copyist down the road a bit. Well, that's easily shredded because Irenaeus in 150 A.D. quotes it in his commentary. The, 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 the uh, Alexandrian codices were 4th century, but in the 1st and 2nd century we have quotes from uh, these so-called verses that were added later. No, they weren't added later. They were expurgated from the Alexandrian codices, is my contention. So Irenaeus either had a copy of the original, or he must have been clairvoyant. I don't think he was kind of clairvoyant. Hippolytus, in the, also in the second century, quotes from these twelve verses. And these are several hundred years before the Alexandrian codices. So if these verses are not in the Alexandrian codices, they were expurgated. So you can attack this scholarship from the point of view of historical records, but I'm going to show you something even more surprising. If we studied the last twelve verses of Mark, we discover that verses 9 to 11 are an appearance to Mary, and, and it just discusses the, t- the disciples' initial disbelief. From verse 11 to 18 are subsequent appearances, and then the conclusion of the chapter is verses 19 to 20. So from 9 to 20 is what we're talking about. Another way to to organize those uh, 12 verses, is from verses 9 to 14 a simple narrative, verses 15 to 18 is a discourse by Jesus Christ, and the last two verses are a conclusion of the whole gospel. And by the way, if you take these 12 verses away, you leave the gospels with the people confused and in disarray and in disbelief. You have no resurrection. So you can see why the Gnostics would love to drop those verses off. But anyway, these are the verses that are there. Let me share some things with you that Panon discovered about these verses. The number of words in these 12 verses are 175. That's a multiple of seven exactly. Oh, really? The vocabulary involved is 98 different words. That's a multiple of seven exactly. The number of letters in the 12 verses are 553. That's a multiple of seven exactly. The vowels are a multiple of seven exactly. The consonants, obviously, would be a multiple of seven exactly. The total vocabulary, I said, was 98 words. 84 of those are found earlier in the book of Mark. That's a multiple of seven exactly. 14 of these words are found only here. It's a multiple of seven exactly. 42 of those words are used in the Lord's address. 56 are not part of his, uh, were not part of his vocabulary that are in, the, in, this, in these 12 verses. All multiple of seven exactly. Now, I've, if I take just two, two rules, if I have one rule, you've got six chances of losing, one of winning, right? To meet two rules, it's seven squared. In other words, I have 48 chances of losing and only one of having both rules of seven. You follow me? It goes by the square, right? 
Two rules is the square. For three rules, it's the cube of that. 340, I'd have 343 chances of losing for every one of winning. And so it goes. For four rules, it's 2401. I've given you so far nine rules. So the ch- the, the, you're, you have one chance, if, if this is a random process, you have one chance in 40 million of coming out okay. You see, how, see it, it, the more rules you add, the more restrictive it becomes. Would you like to try this, by the way? Now, if, assume you worked eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, for 50 weeks a year. That means you've got about 2,000 uh, productive hours per year. And put those in minutes, that's 120,000 minutes per year. You've got seven to nine chances to try this randomly. 40 million attempts. Let's assume it takes you 10 minutes to do a draft. And if it doesn't work, it takes another 10 minutes to draw another draft. Well, then in that case, it would take you about 3,362 years.